How many of us would like to avoid Alzheimer's disease? Yeah. Me too. Yeah. And how many know they're fasting insulin? Okay. How many know their APOE genotype? HHV6A status? Okay. Nocturnal oximetry? <laughs> These underutilized tests are just some of the many critical tests to determine whether you are at risk for Alzheimer's disease, and more importantly, why you may be at risk. But what is Alzheimer's disease? Why is it so common? And why has there been such uniform failure in the quest for a cure? Let's look under the hood. At the heart of Alzheimer's disease is a master switch called APP for amyloid precursor protein. APP is a sensor for numerous factors such as hormones and nutrients and inflammation and growth factors. When these are optimal, APP is cleaved, it's cut by molecular scissors at a single site to produce two peptides or protein fragments, SAPP alpha and alpha CTF. These mediate growth and maintenance. Literally, you are putting your resources into memory formation and maintenance. On the other hand, in the presence of pathogens, things like viruses, bacteria, fungi, or toxins, or reduced support, APP is cut at three sites to produce four different fragments, SAPP beta, A beta, which is the one we classically associate with Alzheimer's disease. But as you can see, it's a much larger story. JCASP and C31. These mediate retraction and protection. Your brain is now in protection mode, pulling back rather than in growth mode. Therefore, what we call Alzheimer's disease is actually a protective response to numerous different pathogens. It's essentially a scorched earth retreat. And the amyloid that we have vilified is not the cause of the disease after all, but actually a protective part of the immune system. So, what flips this switch, this master switch? Well, the bad news is that there are dozens and dozens of different things that can contribute, and that most patients have more than 10 contributors, such as infections, such as P. gingivalis from our dentition, herpes simplex from our lips, Toxins such as metals like mercury or organic toxins like toluene or biotoxins, which are toxins made by some mold species or reduced support from growth factors like brain-derived neurotrophic factor or reduced hormones, estradiol, testosterone, thyroid hormone, or reduced nutrients such as vitamin D or omega-3 fats, or leakiness of your gut lining, or metabolic abnormalities such as diabetes and prediabetes. All of these factors acting on our genetic backgrounds. 
Now the good news is that there are dozens, not thousands. And the great news is that virtually every single one of these is treatable. So given all these factors, what would the perfect Alzheimer's drug look like? Well, the perfect Alzheimer's drug would have to do all of these things. <laughs> and that is a tall order for a drug. And so as you can see, the perfect treatment for Alzheimer's disease may not be a single drug working alone, but instead may be a personalized precision program. And therefore, rather than looking for the elusive silver bullet, we have been developing silver buckshot. And we have used this silver buckshot in a way never done before, asking for each person what are all the contributors to his or her cognitive decline and targeting each one. What is the fasting insulin? What is the pathogen exposure? What is the toxin exposure? And over a hundred different variables. And we have documented and published for the first time reversal of cognitive decline in over 100 patients with Alzheimer's or pre-Alzheimer's. So here are a couple of examples. Marcy had low hormones, low nutrients, and a chronic undiagnosed infection. And you can see how beautifully she did, not only with her cognitive scoring, but also with her hippocampal volume. And the hippocampus is a critical region of the brain for memory, and it is one that is heavily impacted in Alzheimer's disease. Here is Edward, and Edward did beautifully. Edward had low, uh, had chronic inflammation, low methylation, had chronic inflammation, had low pregnenolone, and also had low vitamin D. And not only did he do very well with his cognitive improvement, he has sustained this now for six years, which has been unheard of in Alzheimer's disease. These are just two of the many examples of reversal of cognitive decline, examples in which families got their loved ones back. Now we are in the midst of the first clinical trial in history in which we target and identify all of the contributors to cognitive decline for each person. In contrast, all previous clinical trials have predetermined a treatment and therefore not treated what is actually causing the cognitive decline. This new approach should revolutionize the way we evaluate and treat all neurodegenerative diseases. Our generation will be the last generation to fear Alzheimer's disease. <laughs> Alzheimer's disease will go the way of past scourges, such as leprosy and polio. Our sons and daughters will live in a world in which Alzheimer's is much less common and much more treatable. For the first time ever, we have the ability to make that happen. Thank you.